Willow isn't just one of the best licensed games on the NES, it's also one of the most impressive action RPGs on the system. The game is very loosely based on the 1988 film that was directed by Ron Howard with a story by George Lucas. Considering Lucasfilm was involved in the production of the movie, you would think that Lucas Arts would make the game, but it was Japanese development studio Capcom that acquired the video game rights for Willow. Capcom was looking to broaden the audience for their games in the late 80s and early 90s by developing games based on popular licenses like Little Nemo the Dream Master, Disney's DuckTales, and even Domino's Pizza. Capcom actually developed two completely different games for Willow. One was a side-scrolling action game similar to Ghosts and Goblins for the arcade, and the other was an action RPG for the NES. Capcom clearly wanted Willow to be a success, so they assembled a team of their very best. Takoro Fujiwara, the creator of Ghosts and Goblins and the producer of the Mega Man series, produced the game, and it was designed by Akira Kitamura, one of the original designers of Mega Man. The soundtrack was composed by Harumi Fujita, who had done the music for Final Fight and Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. For Willow, she wrote original music instead of trying to imitate the score from the film. This was a good choice, as her original music fits very well with the action. At a glance, Willow looks a lot like The Legend of Zelda, and while it has similar swordplay, it features a lot more RPG elements, like experience points, numerous weapon and shield upgrades, and random monster encounters. It's actually a lot more like Crystallis or the Magic of Scheherazade than Zelda, and much like the Magic of Scheherazade, Willow does not have a battery to save your progress, but you can resume a previous game by entering an 18-character password. The game was probably less popular than Capcom would have liked when it released in North America in December of 1989. This was well over a year after the film debuted in theaters, and although the movie was profitable, it was no Star Wars, so many people had forgotten about Willow by the time the game was released. Over the years, Willow the movie has become a bit of a cult classic, and similarly, Willow for the NES is often found on lists of hidden gems or underrated games. When IGN released their list of the top 100 NES games of all time, they ranked Willow at number 89. Modern players that attempt this game will still have to deal with all of the challenges the NES is notorious for. Many areas in the game are sprawling mazes that are very easy to get lost in, and it's possible to wander into an unwinnable boss fight just because you're missing a key item. But what if I told you about a secret shortcut that can let you skip a huge chunk of the game? What if I showed you a secret trick to reach the game's maximum level in minutes? And what if I showed you the best way to defeat every boss? Even Bavmorda herself? Well, on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists, news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. Let's get started. All right, Willow. Before we jump into the gameplay, Willow does have a password system but it's one of those awful password systems with 18 characters, upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and even some punctuation thrown in to make sure that only the Zodiac Killer is able to transcribe one of these things. So I highly recommend if you're using the passwords in modern times that you just take a picture of it with your phone. 
This secret password will unlock the game's debug mode, which gives you every weapon, every shield, and all of the magic, but that's not all. If you press select, it'll bring up two coordinates. You'll hold down the A button and press up and down on the control pad to manipulate one of them, and hold down the B button to manipulate the other. And if you go to coordinate 111B, that will take you directly to the final boss. Now, we don't have enough power to actually defeat Bavmorta here, but if we use our select button to warp to another screen, now make sure to go to the lower right corner before you do this, press select, and warp to 1710, that's going to take you to this area near the beginning of the game, and if you just go down, instead you'll be fighting these slime monsters, and if you just beat on them for a while, that's going to count as defeating the boss. Now, the final boss has two forms in this game, so once you receive the Crest of the Spirits, we're just going to do the same thing again. This time, the game's going to be pretty glitchy, so head to the lower right corner, warp to 1710, and then we're just going to go down one screen and fight the slimes. And once we defeat them, this time we will have beaten the game. So, um, Mom, can we return this game early to Blockbuster? If we tell them it was too easy, maybe they'll let us rent something else. Like Mega Man. No? Alright, we'll beat it the regular way. Just like in the film, Willow's story in the game begins in his home village of Nelwyn, and if you enter this building, you can visit Willow's family. This is totally optional, and we haven't taken any damage yet, but if we had, Willow's family would restore our HP. It doesn't cost any money, because there isn't money in this game. Everything is essentially given to Willow for free, and if we head over here to the right and enter this building, we'll meet up with the High Aldwin, who will give us our first magic, the Magic Acorns. Getting the Magic Acorns isn't required, but it's the only magic that we'll have for now. I do think that the cost is a little bit steep at 5 MP. It's essentially like the boomerang in Zelda. When you hit an enemy with a Magic Acorn, it'll be stunned. And later on in the game, we're going to be able to straight murder enemies for 5 MP, so the Magic Acorns will become obsolete. There's only one more item to collect here in the village of Nelwyn, and that's our first weapon, the Long Sword. But if we poke our head into the various buildings around town, the villagers will provide us some clues about the game. This guy tells us that we need to go to the village of Dew, which is a place that would have been impossible to miss, so yeah, thanks for that clue, but some of the other clues may be a little bit more useful. This guy, who asks if we've met Vonkar, the best swordsman in the village, looks to be about Willow's size when we're talking to him, but as soon as we exit this speech bubble, he's enormous! How did he get so big so quickly? Did he, like, eat one of the mushrooms from Super Mario Brothers? Well, in any case, this guy says that there's a demon in the village of Dew. So that's interesting. We'll find out that the demon is not actually in the village of Dew, but just nearby, but the information is somewhat useful. Thanks a lot, guy. Now, if we're looking for something good, we can head up here. And this woman will tell us that weapons and magic items must be in hand in order to use them. So you need to equip stuff, or it's not gonna work. Wow. I am really glad that we talked to her, because how would we have ever figured that out? Now if we talk to this woman, she'll tell us how that we can get to the village of Dew. We just need to keep walking north on this road, so I'll consider that to be a little bit helpful. And if we head over here, there are a number of houses in this village that are totally empty. I'm not going to visit all of them. So maybe we shouldn't have come in here, but if they didn't want us to go inside, they could have at least built a door. 
If we head into this hut, we'll meet a woman that probably has the most useful clue in the entire city. She tells us to stop Bavmorda's magic, we must first dispel the curse that she put on Finn Rizel. And that is something that we will need to do and it's actually easy to forget to do it. Did George Lucas just think that no one had read the Lord of the Rings books or that people just wouldn't notice the obvious similarities between the Nelwyn people and hobbits, or Frodo and Willow? Well, if you head to this hut in the upper left corner, we'll be able to meet with Valkar, and he will give us our first weapon, the long sword. The way that weapons work in this game, each one has a damage value, so the long sword is plus five, and whenever you equip that, you add to it your level. So we're level one right now, so our total strength with the long sword equipped is going to be six. That's how you figure that out. Right now, whenever we attack with the long sword, it's going to be a little bit sluggish because it has a mastery level of three. And all that means is that until we reach level three, we will not be able to swing that sword at its full speed. It doesn't mean that we can't use it though, and we'll need to use something as we fight our way through the path to do. The background comes to life as we fight our first battle. After you clear these slimes, don't go up at the fork. That leads to a dead end. Instead, head over here to the right. As you're battling these slimes, you'll notice that Willow has two different types of attack. He has a poking attack, so if you're holding a direction, you'll be able to do that. It has slightly better range. If you don't hold a direction, he'll do his swinging attack, and that hits all the way around Willow, and sometimes it can score multiple hits on the same enemy. On this screen, there's a trigger for the monster encounter near the middle of the room. Sometimes you'll encounter the monsters as soon as you walk onto the screen, but other ones, like these skulls, are triggered when you step onto a certain space. As we head up onto the next screen, we may be attacked by some more skulls. The skulls can be pretty dangerous in large numbers. You want to group them on the same side of the screen, and then just keep swinging your sword at them as they float towards you. We just leveled up to level 2, so we're a little bit more powerful now. And these slimes are a bit more dangerous than the ones we fought at the beginning. If you hit them a few times, they'll split into four smaller slimes, but if you anticipate the split and swing your sword at them, you can clear them before they even appear. And as we make our way around this last bend, we'll cross the threshold into the Village of Dew. We've done it. We've made it to our first objective. Here in the Village of Dew, we can visit with the chief, but he is not happy to see us. He tells us that outsiders are not welcome here, but he'll change his tune after we talk to someone else in the village. As far as I can remember, the Village of Dew does not appear in the movie, so the developers at Capcom went a little bit off script with this part. You may also notice that we haven't been transporting around the baby, Elora Dannon, and that's the entire focus of the film. We will meet Alora Dannon later on in the game, but for now, we need to focus on defeating the demon Bogarda, who's been ruining everybody's lives and eating all of our steak. The real reason that we need to defeat Bogarda is that there are two exits from this village. There's one on the north side that'll lead us to the cave where Bogarda is, and there's one over on the west side of the village. If we take that exit and we walk far enough, eventually we'll come to a bridge. We will not be able to pass the cursed bridge until we have defeated Bogarda. And if we enter this hut here, down in the lower left corner, we'll talk to this guy, and he'll tell us why the village chief is so sensitive about this Bogarda character. It seems... Bogarda is his father. I mean, George Lucas didn't write the script for the game, but it sure looks like he inspired some of it. This guy will also give us the wood shield. The wood shield adds 5 to our defense, 
And to get our total defense, you also add your level. So take five plus we're level two right now, and that will give us a total defense of seven. Seven is not a very high defensive stat, but before we were rocking a zero, so I guess it's better than nothing. The most important thing about talking to that guy is that now that we know the chief's father is Bogarda, whenever we speak to the chief again, he's going to have something different to say to us. Before we head up here, we can visit the blacksmith. For now, he won't even tell us that he's a blacksmith, but he'll be happy to refill both our HP and our MP, so that's a guy we're going to want to visit almost any time we're in the neighborhood. Let's make our way back to the chief's hut so that we can confront him with what we know, but before we go over there, let's visit this woman and see what she has to say. Well, it seems that the demon Bogarda takes all of the fruit grow in our village and our gold and silver too, because Bogarda does not like vegetables. It's a fact. And we'll head up here, and we'll skip over that hut and make our way to the right. This is the one that we were looking for that has the chief in it. Yo, chief. We heard about your dad. That's brutal, man. Now that the chief knows that we're cool, and that we're here to help out with the whole Bagarda situation, he gives us one of the best spells in the game. The Magical Heal Mace. The Magical Heal Mace takes 20 MP to use, but it's one of the only ways that we're going to be able to restore our health out in the field, and you don't have lives in Willow. If you die, I mean, you're going to have to continue, and you may lose a lot of experience points. It all depends on where you died and how many you had at the time. While we will find a more powerful healing spell later in the game, it'll be a while before we get that one, so we'll certainly be happy to have the magical heal maze for now. Before we move on, this part is optional, but I highly recommend that we head over to the west side of town. If we take a short detour, we'll be able to find a much better shield than this wood shield that we have right now. So just follow this path, Watch out for trolls. If trolls attack you, I highly recommend that you do your best just to run off the screen and don't try to engage them. They could kill you. These are the trolls I'm talking about. So just try to get away from those guys, don't try to fight them, and just make your way into this cave. Now this is a very short and easy cave, so just head up here. It's very straightforward, you can't actually get lost in this one. So we're just going to head over to the left and up. And there's the treasure chest we were looking for. And inside we'll find the small shield. And unlike the plus 5 defense that we got from the wood shield, this one gives a plus 14. Just for doing this short detour, we're going to be able to more than double our defense. So yeah, I think that's worth it, but it is optional. So if you're confident in your abilities, you could skip over this one and just stick with the wood shield. But I think it's worth it to take a few minutes and go get the better shield. Just do it. Watch out for these enemies. Make your way back the way that you came and we're just going to follow the same path back to do. So we don't want to go all the way to the Cursed Bridge, we can't get over the Cursed Bridge right now. And since we have some better defense, if you want to take on the trolls now, I mean go for it, they're not that difficult, especially now that they can't deal you quite as much damage. And they give a decent amount of experience points, so you can see that we've leveled up to level 3, and let's try out that Heal Mace spell. You can see it restored around 50 hit points. Whenever you fight this dog monster, I recommend using the magic acorns against that guy. You can stun it with a magic acorn, and then just beat it senseless with your sword. Here, we're going to go back up to the village of Dew. 
and make our way to the northern path this time. We could stop over at the blacksmith, he'll restore our hit points and our magic. We're not going to be able to get our magic back very easily at this point in the game. So we certainly want to take advantage of this opportunity for a refill. Also, now that we have level 3, we have mastery on our long sword, so we can swing it at maximum speed. Pretty nice. We'll be getting a new sword fairly soon, so we'll have to work up the mastery on that sword next. But for now, we'll be able to swing this one with ease. So we're going to make our way along this path, and we're going to head up. And that'll take us up to the Northern Forest. This area is not particularly large. It contains the cave that Bagarda haunts, but we can't get in there right now, so we want to head left at the first fork. And when we get to this juncture, we need to go down. We'll try to take out these skulls for some experience points, and we'll take advantage of the fact that our sword is faster now. Remember when you fight the blobs on this screen, if they appear, that these are the kind that split into smaller ones. So as soon as it seems like they die, make sure to swing your sword again to kill the small blobs. Over here, you want to continue to the left. The other paths will lead to dead ends. And just follow this one around, where we'll meet a mini-boss. This snake man always shoots fireballs whenever you strike him, so if you stand in this position, face to the right, and just keep swinging your sword, you should be able to hit that guy in such a way that he'll be pushed to the right, and he'll shoot the fireballs too far right to be able to reach you. From here, we just need to go to the left, and you can see we're going to need to face another snake man whenever we loop up and around. For this one, I like to pull him over here to the left side, and then I just strike him once, and step down to the bottom of the screen to avoid those fireballs. Once they're wide enough, I'll be able to step through. So that's how we should fight this guy. It's a pretty conservative strategy, but you should be very safe doing this. So just hit the snake man once and then walk as far down to the bottom of the screen as you can so that those fireballs widen out. Remember, he'll only spit the fireballs whenever you hit him. Whenever we get this treasure chest, we'll find the gold statue, but we'll also find the light of life. And the light of life is going to restore our hit points. So if you took any damage fighting those snake man enemies, don't immediately use the heal mace. You're going to get a full heal whenever you open the treasure chest. And you can see we have the gold statue in our inventory. Items in this game you do not need to equip or use. They are used automatically. The gold statue is nothing more than a key. So whenever we get to Bogarda's cave, there's a guard waiting outside, but if you have the gold statue, he'll let you in. That's why we needed to get it before we went to Bogarda's cave, and this enemy was a little bit more difficult before, but now that we have level 3, we can easily thrash that guy. So we're just going back the same way that we came. We'll take out these skulls for some experience points. And over here, if we head down, we can go back to do. so if you're a little bit banged up, you may want to go back down there, but we're in good shape, so we don't need to get our HP and MP refilled at the blacksmith, we're just going to press on. If you're damaged though, it doesn't take a long time to pop back into do and get a refill, so make sure to take advantage of that. And if you're going to fight these enemies, I recommend using the acorns, if they fly off the screen, you won't be able to damage them, and the fight will just end abruptly after a while, so you want to stun those guys so you have enough time to finish them off. And as we head over here to the left, there's that guard outside of Bogarda's cave, and you'll see that because we have the gold statue, he's going to let us in. Bogarda's Cave is going to be our first dungeon of the game. 
Now I'm trying to stay on the left side of this corridor because sometimes you get attacked by bees in here and it's best to be prepared for that. They come from the right side. Instead, we'll get attacked by bat monsters. Remember when you're fighting these guys that whenever you kill one of the bigger bats, the smaller bats are going to step up and try to transform. So if you can take out some of those smaller bats while they're still small, you won't have to deal with them when they're big. We leveled up to level 4 though, so that was good news. And when we get to this fork, we want to head down. So keep walking downwards. If you encounter the zombie enemy, run. We don't have what we need to fight that guy right now, and he can turn you into a pig. If you get turned into a pig, you will need to stay on the same screen and just try to dodge the zombie's attacks until you turn back to Willow. You will not be able to escape the screen you're on as a pig. Make your way down through this door. And we're going to head up when we get to this room. In this room, we're going to be able to get an optional item, the ring. And you can see we have a strength of 9 right now because we have a plus 5 sword and we're level 4, so we have 9. But once we get the ring, that adds 10 to our strength. We wear it automatically so you don't need to do anything, and you can see now we have a strength of 19. We're going to be able to get that plus 10 for the rest of the game, so it's certainly worth stopping in here to grab the ring. That more than doubled our attack. Whenever we encounter some enemies, you'll be able to see how much better we are with the ring, and here are those bats again. And you can definitely notice the difference. Here's some more bats. These ones didn't even turn into big bats because we killed them so quickly. And that's the zombie enemy that you want to avoid. You can see that we can't damage him right now, so just run whenever you see that guy. These large bees are the ones that sometimes attack in those tight hallways, so you want to watch out for those. And we're just going to make our way around and to the right. In this room, we're going to head up, and we'll find another treasure chest here. This is the Battle Sword. The Battle Sword adds plus 14 to our attack, and that's 9 more than the Long Sword that we were currently using adds. So although the Battle Sword has a mastery level of 5 and we're only at level 4, the plus 9 more attack that it offers us is going to be worth the trade, and we're going to be able to swing it fairly quickly at level 4 anyways. So we'll equip the Battle Sword. It's not quite as good of an upgrade as the ring which gave us plus 10, but plus 9 is nothing to sneeze at. You'll notice right away as we swing at these hornets that they go down much more quickly, and having the battle sword is going to make the next boss even easier, although this boss is not that difficult anyway. Make your way around this winding path to the A on the map, and that will bring us to the boss room. It's about time for us to fight Bogarda. If you need to heal yourself, use Heal Mace before you go into the boss's room. Right now we have plenty of health, so we don't need to use it, but it's definitely worth noting, you won't be able to use it while you're fighting this guy. Bogarda is actually very easy to defeat. He mirrors your movement, so you want to walk him to the upper left corner, and then just wait while facing him until he attacks. You'll block it, and as soon as you hear the sound that you blocked it, give him a big full swing with your sword. Then just wait for him to hit you again, block it, and swing another time. Keep doing this until Bogarda is defeated, and you should be able to easily take this guy out without taking a single bit of damage. When Bogarda is defeated, he snaps out of the spell and turns back into a human. Then he teaches you the magic of Flowing Fire. Flowing Fire only costs 5 MP, which is the same amount of magic points that it takes to cast a magic acorn, except this makes a bunch of fire spurt out in a circle around Willow and can actually fry the enemies. In my opinion, it's a lot better than the magic acorns. 
Unfortunately, at this point in the game, we don't have the magic spell of fleet, so we can't just get out of this dungeon very easily. Instead, we're going to have to retrace our steps and walk back out of the dungeon, which isn't a whole lot of fun, but it will give us an opportunity to try out that flowing fire magic. It's nice to have a spell like Flowing Fire because there are some enemies in the game that you can't damage with regular weapons, but you can damage them with magic, and until we had a spell like Flowing Fire that actually deals damage, we had no way of fighting an enemy like the zombie that we had to run from earlier. Although, if you do face the zombie, I still recommend that you run at this point in the game. One other nice thing about the Flowing Fire is that many enemy types, like the skulls we were fighting in the forest earlier, just tend to gravitate towards Willow, and because the Flowing Fire makes a bunch of small flames surrounding our hero, those enemies oftentimes will go right into the fire. And that brings us to the exit of the cave. We can head back towards the village of Dew to get a refill, and we have to actually pass through the village anyways to get to our next destination, so we might as well stop at that blacksmith and completely refill our HP and MP. Take out these enemies and try to build up a bit more experience points as we head back towards the village. We're going to be getting a full refill on our HP and MP, so we can be a little bit reckless on our way back. Now you may have been wondering, why does he keep calling this guy the blacksmith? He seems more like an innkeeper than anything. And although he has been restoring our health and magic points for the entire game, this time whenever we talk to him after defeating Bogarda, he has a new message for us. He asks if we've heard about the Dragon Scales. So basically, if we find the Dragon Scale item and bring it back to this guy, he's going to be able to make us some good equipment. So we will find those Dragon Scales in the next dungeon, and we want to remember to bring them back here because the Dragon Sword and the Dragon Shield are actually pretty good. So after we promise to keep our eyes open for Dragon Scales, we're going to make our way to the west exit of the Village of Dew, and we're going to head towards that cursed bridge which isn't cursed anymore. So we're just going to keep going to the left, and eventually we'll come to this curvy path and we'll head downwards, and instead of going to the left here to go to the cave where the small shield is, we'll go down and we're going to encounter some skeleton enemies. Now, skeletons are one of the more annoying enemy types because they're pretty adept at blocking you with their shield. Right now, we're not even using a sword that has full mastery, so you may just want to try to chip at the skeletons or just try to move them away from the bottom of the screen so you can walk around them. I'll show you a more effective way of fighting skeletons later. On this screen, we'll fight some blue skulls, which are more powerful than the gray skulls we fought earlier, but they fight in the same manner, so by using the flowing fire and just staying in the middle of the flames, they'll fly right into it and you'll be able to defeat them easily. Before we cross the cursed bridge, we'll have our first encounter with Kitchell from the Nail Clan. The people in the game keep describing these Nail Clan guys as looking like rabbits, but I know a bushy-tailed squirrel when I see one, and that's totally what these guys look like to me. Whenever you're done talking to Fat Gus, make your way across the bridge. You may get attacked by enemies, but now that we've defeated Bogarda, we will be able to cross and make our way into the Forest of Death. Here in the Forest of Death, even the trees can attack us. So this forest is deadly indeed. As we make our way up the path, we're going to encounter a familiar set of characters from the movie. It's the Brownies, Frangine and Roll. 
Now, don't ever forget, Frangine is the one that's in charge. If you take a moment to listen to these guys, they'll outline everything that we need to do next. We need to meet up with Cherlindra, and she's located in an area of the game called Lake Chief. So we certainly need to go there, but to get there, we need to go through a cave, and in that cave there's a dragon called Matanda. They also tell us that we need to defeat Matanda and bring back an item called the Crystal Ball of Life. And yeah, we're not going to do that. Instead, our adventure is going to take a different path. But for now, we need to work our way through this forest of death. Sometimes those trees are going to attack and they spit fireballs. You can't really fight back against those guys, so just try to avoid them whenever it happens and make your way to this hut in the middle of the left side of the forest. This place is called Poe's House. Here at Poe's House, we meet an old woman who tells us that her darling pet, a bird-like monster named Poe, has run off, and he hasn't even come back to get his medicinal herbage, so there's a good chance something bad may have happened to him. We'll take a sample of those herbs just in case we run into her prized pet, and spoiler alert, we are going to run into that guy in the next cave. From Poe's house, we want to head over to the right, and then we're going to follow this path up and around. If the trees come to life, just try to avoid the fire that they spit and move on. And when we come down to the bottom here, we're going to head over to the right. There are no hidden treasure chests here in the Forest of Death, so we just want to make our way to the next area, the cliffside. And if you do take the time to fight these flying enemies, remember you want to hit them with the acorns so that they'll be stunned, and then they won't fly off the screen where you won't be able to kill them. In this area, make sure to bear to the right, and then we're just going to follow the path all the way to the top, and we'll start working our way over to the left. The blue flying enemies are even more dangerous than the ones we fought previously, so remember to definitely use your acorns if you want to take the time to fight those. Don't bother messing around with the trees, just keep making your way to the left, and eventually the path will curve upward, and that will take us to the cliffside. When we get to the cliffside, there's two paths you can take. I like to take the path on the right side, but you could go to the left right here if you want to. That will also get you to Matanda's cave. In this area, you may have to fight some large snake man or a two-headed pink demon. The pink demon spawns on this screen. Now, we didn't get it that time, so I'll just step back down, and here it is. If you have to fight this guy, let it spit three fireballs, then get right in front of it and start swinging your sword rapidly. That's the way I recommend fighting that guy. And if you want to fight the trolls, they're not bad for experience points. Just try to group them all on the same side of the screen. And here it is, Matonda's Cave. Matonda's Cave is a winding maze of blue corridors, but there's a decent amount of loot in here for us to find. The first thing that we're going to be looking for is a new shield. So once we go through the first door, we're going to head down at the first intersection and then make our way to the left. Over here we'll find a door, and when we head through here, this is going to take us to the room where we find the shield. So we'll open this up, and inside, we have obtained the gold shield. Is that the exact same sound effect from DuckTales? I feel like I just found the key to the African mine. And it seems that there was something written on the inside, but we can't read it, so I'm not sure what relevance that has. But the shield will give us plus 24 defense, which is 10 more than the amount of defense we had previously. So that's a pretty nice upgrade. It certainly is optional, you don't have to get that shield, but you'll be happy to have it. And once you've grabbed the shield, make your way back the way that we came, and we're going to head up to this intersection, and we're going to go right this time instead of down. 
from here, if we keep making our way to the right, we're going to run right into another treasure chest, and this one's going to contain a more powerful weapon, the Flame Sword. You may have to fight some blue hornets. They seem slower than the ones we fought before, but they do seem to have more hit points and are a bit more dangerous, so be cautious as you fight those, but they can help you get some more experience points. And here's that treasure chest we were looking for. Inside is the Flame Sword. The Flame Sword adds plus 29 to our attack, which is 10 more than we were working with previously, so that's a nice upgrade even if the mastery level is 7 and we're only level 5 right now. No big deal. We should still be able to wield this thing pretty effectively, even if we aren't swinging it at full speed. From here, we're going to make our way down and to the left. And over here, we'll find a treasure chest with an item we've been kind of looking for, the Dragon Scale. We are going to run into an actual dragon, but instead of getting the Dragon Scale from her, we find it in a treasure chest. So, I mean, that's just how things work in this game sometimes. And from here, we're going to backtrack over to where we found the sword, and whenever we get there, we're going to take the path to the north. So we'll head north here, and then we're going to go to the right, and we'll follow this winding path along, and this is going to take us to the right side of the map, and that's where all the really important stuff is. So this is door C, and if we follow this path, this is going to take us to Poe. We got those medicinal herbs so that we can heal Poe, and he's going to need them, and whenever we give him those herbs, he's going to give us a new magic spell, the Ocarina. Whenever we play the Ocarina outside of a dungeon, we'll be able to summon Poe, and he'll be able to take us to one of six different locations, assuming that we've been to those locations previously. Right now, we won't be able to go to all six different locations, but the ability to fast travel to even a few locations is going to be very useful. It seems that our friend Poe here messed with the dragon and got the flames. So he's a little bit injured, but now that he's consumed those medicinal herbs, he'll be fine. And it seems that he found an ocarina out in the forest, and so he'll give it to us so that we can summon him. It does cost 20 magic points to summon Poe using the Ocarina, so keep that in mind. If you use up all of your magic, you're not going to be able to call Poe to get you out of there. Whenever we meet Poe here in the cave, he will also completely refill your magic points. So if you had taken any damage up until this point, it's a good idea to use your heal mace magic before you talk to Poe. With the ocarina in our possession, we'll head back the way that we came. The only thing left to do now is to meet up with Matonda the dragon, and that's where we're going to get the bracelet. So it may sound like we're about to go into a boss fight or we need to get this crystal ball thing, but no. All we actually have to do is talk to Matonda, and he's going to be able to give us the bracelet, and that's going to open a different path in this very cave, and that's how we're going to get to Lake Chief. These skeleton enemies are particularly annoying in tight spaces. The best way to fight those guys is to stand perpendicular to them and just start swinging your sword. They won't block it. Just keep making your way down to the bottom here, where we'll find a small room, and inside is Matonda. Matonda immediately accuses us of being a thief. It's like, whoa, whoa there, buddy. We're not trying to steal anything. We don't even really need that crystal ball. We just need a way to get out of this cave so that we can get to Lake Chief and meet up with Cherylindra. Matonda gives us a bracelet that some other thief left here, and you gotta wonder, 
was the original owner of the bracelet actually a thief? Or does Matanda just accuse everyone who comes through there of being a thief? Well, in any case, whenever we come out, you may have to fight these red skeletons, which are the most dangerous variety of skeleton. Remember, if you stand perpendicular to them, you'll be able to swing your sword and they won't block it. Use your heal mace if you need it. And now all we need to do is go back to the area where the entrance of the cave was. That's where we'll be able to use the thieves bracelet to open up a new path. So we'll head back here to the left. This is the room right above where the flame sword is, so we'll head down. And in the room that has the treasure chest, that's where you want to start heading to the left. So just keep working your way to the left from the room where you found the flame sword, and that will eventually bring you all the way back to where the cave entrance is. So just keep heading to the left, and once we go one more screen over, this is the door we were looking for. Now whenever we head over here to the left, a new path is going to open up. So we'll go past the actual cave entrance, which is right there, and you'll see that that wall just disappeared. And when we continue to the left, we'll be able to enter a new door. We've done it. This is Lake Chief. Lake Chief certainly sounds like it could be a very big place, and we may have to search high and low to find this Cherlindra person. Or maybe as soon as we exit Matanda's cave, we will immediately find her. So that's a stroke of good fortune. And I have to say, this scene here in the game looks a lot like the scene in the movie. They did a great job of recreating the look of Cherlindra with a bunch of pixies surrounding her. Just like in the movie, Cherlindra gives us her magic cane, and although we don't have the experience levels to use it here in the game, it will be very important later on, whenever we're fighting the final boss. So it's going to sit idly in our inventory for now, but the magic cane is a mandatory item, and it will be very important later on. Cherylindra tells us that to be able to unlock the full potential of the cane, we'll need to meet up with the sorceress Finn Rizel, so we'll just add that on to the list of things that we need to do. Our largest obstacle here in Lake Chief is the lake itself. Like the heroes of many other Zelda-style adventure games, Willow is not a swimmer. He actually sinks like a stone, and if you wander into the water, you will lose hit points rapidly, so don't do that. We'll have to find another way across. Also, if you run into this gray mage enemy, you want to run away from that guy as quickly as possible. He can cast thunder magic on you if you leave him on the screen for too long, and right now, we can only damage him using magic. Well, we can only damage him using magic until we found this, the Devil Eye. The Devil Eye is one of the most damaging weapons in the game, and you can see it has a super high mastery level of 13, so it's gonna be a little bit sluggish in our hands here at level five, but plus 89 giving us 104 strength? What's going on here? Well, yeah, the Devil Eye has a small caveat. It doesn't work on most enemies. However, the enemies that it does work on are the ones that our regular weapons don't work on, so although this seems like a disadvantage, it is a very useful weapon. Over here, we've run into Mad Mardigan, the Daikini warrior played by Val Kilmer in the movie. To be able to proceed on here, we're going to need to find a key to unlock his handcuffs. But before we do that, let's head up here and make our way to the local bar. Whenever we go in here, we'll be able to get our hit points and magic refilled, but that's not all. This is one of the locations that Poe can bring us to using the ocarina. So now that we've visited the bar, it'll be on the list. 
So it's very important that we get to this bar right away because we have a few places that we want to go to, but we want to be able to get back here easily. So now that we've been to the bar, we can summon Poe for 20 magic points. And let's go back to the village of Dew. Remember, we found those dragon scales, and there was a blacksmith in Dew who promised to give us a really nice weapon and shield if we brought him back those scales. Conveniently, Dew is one of the places that Poe can bring us to. And you know the way to the blacksmith's hut, we've been here many times. So we're just going to head around this path. Obviously there's more than one way you can get here. But we're going to go inside and not only is he going to give us back the magic points that we spent to summon Poe using the ocarina, but he is very excited to see that dragon scale. Now we're going to be able to get two items here, the shield, which is nice, plus 34 defense, but we are going to get an even better item, the dragon sword. The dragon sword adds 39 strength. It's not as good as the devil eye, but it works against most regular enemies, and it's going to be quite some time before we get a better weapon. Getting this dragon stuff is totally optional, but I do think that it's worth it. It doesn't really take a lot of time to go get these items. The next thing that we're going to do is a pretty interesting trick. This is the game's big shortcut. So we're going to use Poe to go back to Poe's house. Poe's house is in the Forest of Death, and in the Forest of Death there's an interesting room where the developers forgot to code one of the walls properly, and you can just walk right through. So I'm going to show you where that is. Head over here, and we're going to go down. We're looking for this screen right here with the four trees, and you can walk through right on that space. Now make sure you go high enough up on the screen when you walk over to this one, or you could get stuck. And there's two places you can go here. We're going to take this upper path, which warps you to the game's left tower. So there's two towers in the game, and the left tower is normally locked until you complete the one on the right side. Because we're going to the left tower without going to the right one, we're going to be able to skip the right tower completely. And using this shortcut, we can skip a lot more than that. We're going to be able to skip the entirety of the island caves, which is a pretty decent sized dungeon. All we need to do is get to the top of this tower and we're going to be able to get the red crystal. In the game, they make it out like you need both the red and the blue crystal to make the spirit crest, but really it's only checking to see if you have the red one. Whenever you see these enemies, they will try to steal your magic points, so you don't want to leave them on the screen very long unless you want to start fighting them. They'll continuously divide and you can only damage them using the devil eye. Whenever they die though, they will drop items that restore your magic, so that is kind of good. Still though, you're probably going to lose a lot of magic points while you're fighting these guys, and they are very dangerous, so unless they're in your way, I don't recommend tangling with them. I'm about to show you a much better way to level up, so don't get too excited about fighting those guys. Make sure you talk to the Spirit of Earth so that you get the red crystal, and then we're presented with an interesting problem. Normally when you get to this part in the game, you would have the fleet magic, which would allow you to just exit the dungeon. Well, we don't have the fleet magic, but what we do have is the ocarina, and you can call Poe from the top of the tower. So if you have at least 20 magic points, if those blob guys that split into two parts didn't steal all of your magic, well then you can just call Poe, and he will take us back to Poe's house. If you don't have enough magic points, just go back into the tower and keep fighting those dividing enemies until you have enough MP, and then come back out here and call Poe. It shouldn't be too hard to get 20 magic points together. So we're going to go back to Poe's house, and we're going to head to that same screen with the shortcut, although we definitely should stop into Poe's house and refill our HP and MP before we go. You won't have a lot of great opportunities to do that. 
And we just head down here, and here's where the shortcut is. Now the enemies were activated this time, no big deal, it still works. And we're going to cross over, and we're going to take this lower door this time. This door is going to lead us to the area outside the towers, and we'll be able to visit with Elora Dannon, and that's where we'll be able to get the Spirit Crest now that we have the Red Crystal. So all we need to do, just follow the path along. We're heading down and out this time, so it's like we're climbing down the tower, but this is the easiest way to get up there and allows us to skip a lot of the game. It's also going to allow us to do the level up trick, so we'll be able to do that next after we get the Spirit Crest. But the Spirit Crest is going to allow us to unlock the mountain region, so by having that we'll be able to skip a huge chunk of the game, so we certainly want to grab it. It's one of the most important items in the game, and we have a very good opportunity to get it right here. Just remember that because we took a shortcut, we are a little bit underleveled for this part of the game, so you don't want to be tangling with too many of the enemies. That could get you in trouble. And we'll head through this door, and that should bring us to the outside. So this area is where the Twin Towers are, and in the middle of the towers is a woman holding the baby, Alora Dannon. Now that we have the red crystal, and the game acts like we have both crystals because it doesn't think that it's possible for us to get one and not the other. So since we have the red crystal, well then it feels fine to give us the Crest of the Spirits. And that is a very useful item that will allow us to advance in the game much farther than we were able to before. But before we do that, there's another trick that we're going to do. So we have the Crest of the Spirits, you don't need the Crest of the Spirits to be able to do the level up trick. You can do the level up trick and not get the Crest of the Spirits, instead you could just have taken the lower door at the shortcut and avoided doing a lot of this stuff if all you wanted to do was gain a bunch of levels. So you see we have it, but we're going to follow this path downward. And this path is going to lead us to the exit of the Haunted Island Caves. We should not be able to go to the exit of the Haunted Island Caves right now because we haven't completed that cave. And the exit is a boss's room, so this is going to be very interesting when we go in here. The boss here is a guy named Moose, and we actually cannot defeat Moose, so we just want to go right back onto the door. Now normally you wouldn't be able to do that. And now when we go back in, suddenly we're fighting Kale, the next to last boss in the game. And we just want to position ourselves right here and he'll walk towards us and just keep slicing at him with your best weapon. Give him a bunch of stabs. You do not want to actually kill Kale, so you just want to wound him. But be careful about this, he could damage you if you don't do it right. And once you have him down to low HP, you're going to exit the boss's room. Now here's the thing, you can see that the game still thinks that we're in a boss's room. It's very confused at this point. If we kill General Kale normally in the game, we'd get 8,000 experience points. And if you remember at the beginning of the game when we were doing that debug mode trick, well, whenever we went to a different room with enemies, the game still thought we were fighting the boss, and that's what happens here. So whenever we encounter enemies in this tower, and we're going to be able to find them over here in a room with a bunch of flying enemies that spawn, this seems to be the closest room to do this trick with. Whenever we fight those guys, the game's gonna think that we killed Kale, and it's going to award us that 8,000 experience points. But that's not all, so I want to kill this guy. And there it is, you can see the experience points are racking up. 8,000 is a lot of experience points. But if we exit the room and go back in, it thinks we're still fighting Kale for some reason, and will allow us to get the 8,000 experience points again. If you do this 12 or 13 times, you will max out your level. Level 16 is the highest level in the game, and it actually takes a minute or two just for the experience points to run up that high. 
So make sure that you hang out and actually get level 16 before you decide to exit the tower. So that's what you need to do after you've killed enough enemies and you've leveled up to level 16. You're going to exit the tower, that is very important. So when you reach 99,990 experience, that is the game's highest level. But if you want to be able to keep this level, we need to go back out of the tower. And once we get back out of the tower, we're going to re-enter the tower, and then we're going to get ourselves killed. After we get killed, all the glitchiness will be fixed, but we'll be able to keep the experience points, and then we can move on and do whatever we want in the game. If you do not leave and re-enter the tower, and then you get killed by the enemies, well then you would lose all of the experience points that you had earned, so you would go back to level 5 or whatever you were when you started this whole thing, so you don't want that to happen. That also means that while you're actually fighting those enemies to level up, if they were to kill you, you would lose everything, so you can't be reckless when you're doing this. These enemies aren't that difficult, but they can kill you if you're not paying attention. And after we get killed here, you'll see that we continued and we still have level 16, although we do need to re-equip all of our items. Now that's an awesome trick and a very fast way to level up, but if you feel like that's cheating, let's get back to playing the game the regular way. So we just got the Dragon Sword and the Dragon Shield, and we haven't really completed any of the objectives over at Lake Chief, so we're going to head back to the bar and start doing some of the things we need to do over in that area. As we head back to the other area, if you're feeling underleveled, we're currently level 5 and I think that's fine, but if you need a few more levels, if you are under level 5, there's an area right over here where we can build up a few low levels. This won't be good for leveling up any higher than maybe level 6 or 7, it'll get pretty slow at that point. But if you need to catch up on levels and you don't want to use that glitch to quickly max yourself out to level 16, this is not a bad way to do it. This is the room up here. So we're going to head up here and in this room there's an easy to see trigger point that makes the skulls appear. It's over in that upper right corner area, past where that stump is in the background. Now if you enter from this direction, walk over towards the stump, you'll see the skulls will appear every time and if you get in this position and just swing your sword around, you should be able to kill the skulls pretty easily. They just will gravitate right towards Willow. If you take enough damage that you're worried about your health, you can just walk back to the bar and you'll get all of your HP refilled, so you may actually just want to use your heal mace a few times before you make the trip back to the bar, but it's really not very far away, so if you're concerned that you're getting low, you can head back here at any time. We will have to level up to at least level 13 later in the game, but right now, I don't think that our experience level makes a huge difference. It would be nice to have more HP and MP, but if we play smart, we won't have to use a lot of magic, and we shouldn't take a lot of damage. So we should be able to get by at a lower level, and later on in the game we'll have access to much more powerful level up strategies, and we'll be able to get those experience points much more quickly. The first thing we need to do to get out of this area is unshackle Mad Mardigan, and to do that we're going to need the key. If you get ambushed by these skeletons, the best way to fight them is to stand perpendicular to the skeleton, so you're not facing the skeleton, it's like you're sideways to it. And then just start swinging your sword and they won't block it. These skeletons aren't attacking in a way that we can't avoid them, so we'll just head over here to the left. We're making our way to the lower left corner, so just keep going to the left or down, and you'll eventually come across this treasure chest. Bless me bagpipes, we found the hidden key! The key is old and quite rusty, so maybe that's why the person that captured Mad Mardigan wanted to hide it in a random treasure chest instead of just keeping it in their pocket. I know whenever I take someone prisoner, I think, it would be a good idea to leave this key somewhere out in the forest 
just in case. Well, it's a good thing that we have the key, so we can go and unlock Mad Mardigan, and for our troubles, he's going to give us a seemingly useless item. It's a necklace, but it will advance the story, so it is important to do this. Until we unshackle Mad Mardigan, we won't be able to get the Waka seed that we need to be able to breathe underwater, and we won't be able to get past the lake. We need to take the dragon sword instead of the devil eye. The devil eye will not deal damage to these skeletons. So make sure to switch to that if you are using the devil eye to fight the mask enemies in this area. Whenever you kill the mask enemies in this area, they will give you back some magic points. So those guys are nice to fight, but they can only be killed using the devil eye or a magic spell. Just as a way of saying thank you, Mad Mardigan gives us a necklace made of poor quality glass, because that's just the kind of guy he is. And now that he's free, he immediately goes to the bar. So that's where we need to go to. Poe, yep, it's time to call our friend Poe and have him ferry us over to the Tavern of the Traveler. It's not that far of a walk, but we can get there a lot faster by flying. This time when we go to the Tavern of the Traveler, we're going to see a slightly different scene than we usually see here. Of course, the woman that works here has to say the exact same thing to us that she says every time, because corporate requires that. But this guy has the audacity to say that he hasn't seen us around here before? Like, how many other Nelwins could possibly be going to this bar? He wants to know if we're going to the cave that's haunted by a ghost that kills anyone that goes near it. I mean, yeah, that's definitely where we wanted to go. Can you please let me know where the cave entrance is? Well, at this point, Mad Mardigan interjects into the conversation, and it's because that we rescued Mad Mardigan that this is even happening. He thanks us for helping him out of a jam, and lets us know that it was Sorsha, Bavmorda's daughter, who captured him and took him prisoner, and I assume she's also the one that hid the key in a treasure chest in the forest? Not her best move. Mad Mardigan lets us know that we need a Waka seed to be able to breathe water, and the only way we can get one is from a member of the Nail Clan a member of which we have met before. He tells us they look like a rabbit with antlers, and we know that's wrong. The Nail Clan are squirrels. What you just described, Mad Mardigan, is called a jackalope, and it's not the same thing. After that whole scene has transpired, Kitchell from the Nail Clan will now appear towards the entrance of Lake Chief, so back near the exit to Matanda's cave. So that's where we're going to head right now. Here's some of those skeletons. We know how to fight them by standing perpendicular to them. If that skeleton changes his angle of attack, we should change ours. But we didn't need to. We were easily able to clear that guy. And we're just going to keep heading to the right until we can't anymore, and then we're going to head down. This is going to be a pretty long downward path. But at the end of it, we'll meet up with Kitchell, and he will give us the Waka seed that we need to move on. So that's the chain of events here. First you need to find the key, then use the key on Mad Mardigan. After Mad Mardigan is free, go to the bar. After you see the scene at the bar, come down here to meet with Kitchell. You'll get the Waka seed. Now we can just fly back to the bar and we'll be able to go under the water, and that's how we're going to get to the mountains. You ever wonder what Poe was doing before we call him with the ocarina? Like he just got a cold pint and had settled in with his boys to watch a Quidditch match or whatever bird monsters do in the Willowverse, and he's like, ah, sorry guys, I have to go carry this Nelwyn dude to the bar. See, he gave me some medicinal herbs one time, and I kind of agreed to this whole thing while I was still feeling the effects of those, but I am a man of my word, so you gotta do what you gotta do. In any case, this time when we stop into the bar, the tavern owner tells us that Mad Mardigan is no longer there. 
so we'll have to catch up with him later. For now, we're going to follow this path. Whenever we go north here, we're going to be attacked by some crab monsters. These guys are worth a good bit of experience points, but you can only damage them when they come out of the shells, so I wouldn't mess around with them for now. Instead, we're going to go under the water, and you can see that we're not taking any damage because we have the Waka Seed. So we'll just follow this path along, and when we emerge on the other side, we'll be in the Rocky Mountains. This is a very important cave because inside we will meet the messenger of the Earth, Finn Rozelle. We've been looking for her, but just like in the movie, she's been transformed into a possum by Bavmorda's magic, so we'll need to use Cherlindra's magic cane to turn her back. Unfortunately, until we get to level 13, we won't be successful. However, the programmers added a lot of different transformations for us to see to represent many of the different forms that she took in the movie. So if you keep trying to change her, you'll see her turn into a goat and a bird and an ostrich and eventually a tiger. So those are all the different transformations and then she'll start turning back into other beasts that you've seen before. There's nothing that can be done for Finn Rozelle right now, so we'll make a mental note of where this cave is and promise to come back when we're at least level 13. Now that cave is where we need to go next, but if we head up here, we'll see that the way is blocked by Bavmorda's daughter, Sorsha. If you remember from when we did the shortcut, once you get the Crest of the Spirits, this is where we'll be able to pass. So until we have that crest, we won't be able to get past Sorsha there. So for now, we'll have to go into this cave. These are the Haunted Island Caves. The first cave here is pretty straightforward. There's only one way you can go, and eventually you'll find the door that will lead onwards. If you want to fight one of these mage enemies, you need to use the Devil Eye or Magic, and you need to kill it quickly, or it will use Thunder Magic on you. You'll also need to use the Devil Eye to kill these mask enemies, and any of these enemies that you need to kill with the Devil Eye will usually drop an item that will restore your magic points. So, that guy just tried to use Flowing Fire on us. Not gonna mess around with that, and we'll make our way around this corner. You can't go the wrong way in here. Now I don't recommend trying to mess around with this zombie enemy. He will turn you into a pig, so try to run past him if you can, but there's a good chance you'll get turned into a pig anyway if you see one of these guys, at which point you'll need to keep dodging the bubbles and then quickly get off the screen so you don't get transformed again. In the movie, Bavmorda turns an entire army of people into pigs, so this enemy being able to do that to you is a little nod to the film. This enemy will steal some of your magic points whenever it divides into two, but you can get those magic points back when you kill it using the Devil Eye. Over here, we're going to get our magic completely refilled whenever we open this chest, so you may want to use your heal mace before you collect it. And inside, we'll find the magic of Fleet, which is a very useful spell. The Fleet spell is a lot like the Exit spell from Final Fantasy. If you're in a dungeon and you no longer want to be in said dungeon, all you need to do is equip the Fleet spell. It costs 20 MP, but it will bring you outside to the area where you entered that dungeon. So this is certainly a convenient spell to have, and it's one that's pretty hard to miss. Once you have that magic, you're just going to keep following the path around and eventually it will come to this doorway which will bring you out onto an island. You can go left or right on this island, but right leads to a dead end, so you want to head left. And it will wrap around and lead you to another doorway which will bring you into another cave. There's three of those crabs on that screen. Want to watch out for those guys and head back into the Haunted Island Caves. The boss of this area is a demon named Muz, or maybe it's Muz. Well, whatever it is, we cannot fight that boss right now, so we need to avoid his room. Until we have the Cross Flute, 
This boss will just keep regenerating health and will never die. So we need to go to the right here. Do not go up. You should also skip this first door. That'll take us in the wrong direction. And instead we need to go through this door. This path is going to lead us to the cross flute. So that's where we're headed right now. Hopefully we can avoid most of the zombie enemies. And this guy has turned us into a pig, so we'll need to work that off. If you fight the lizard man enemies, you'll want to equip your dragon sword to fight them. And remember that every time you strike them, they release the fireballs. So you'll probably want to be standing sideways so you can push them to the left or the right. We'll just follow this path along. Not going to mess with that bat monster. And just keep going around this curve. You can't get lost at this point. This is going to take us to door letter D. Door D is very important because as soon as we exit onto this small island, we're going to get an essential item, Xena's Cross Flute. This item is given to us by a strange ghost named Xena who is looking for her lost love. This definitely didn't happen in the movie, and is most certainly not canon. Maybe it happened in the Willow book or something. Xena's missing love is the boss of this area, a hideous porcupine monster. I don't get what she sees in that guy, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and she gives us her cross flute, which is an essential item for defeating that boss. Once we have it, we can cross over this bridge and head deeper into the caves, in this slightly larger cave, we'll be able to find some optional items, but there's some useful magic here that we will be using in the game, so while it's optional, we probably should collect it. This is another one of those treasure chests that's going to restore our MP, so don't forget to use your heal mace before you collect the Demon's Feather, which will give us the magic of Turstorm. Turstorm will clear some of the enemies from the screen with a big gust of wind. You will not get experience points for killing those enemies, but it only costs 5 magic points, and while it doesn't work on all enemy types, it's not the worst, so you'll probably be happy to pick up that treasure chest, even just to refill your magic points. We are going to get a slightly more useful magic spell in this area, but before that, we're going to get a new shield. So we'll head over here to the left, and we'll find a treasure chest containing the metal shield. Yeah, that's what you would think most shields would probably be made out of. The metal shield will add a plus 49 to our defense, which is 15 more than we were getting from the dragon shield. So that's a pretty solid upgrade. You'll certainly want to pick that one up, and in a cave that's located right below where the metal shield is, that's where we're going to find that other magic spell. The red skeletons are the most dangerous skeletons, but if we stand perpendicular to them and swing our sword, we should be able to easily finish them off now. We're getting pretty powerful. You can use up whatever magic you want before you pick up this chest because you're going to get a full MP restore. And this gives us the Book of Magic, which allows us to cast the Spell of Renew. The Spell of Renew is a weird one. Renew will transform some enemies into other enemy types. It seems kind of random, and sometimes it could potentially make the enemies worse. You may remember in the movie when Willow transformed a troll into a giant two-headed monster, so that wasn't a particularly good deal. But the spell of Renew only costs 3 magic points, making it one of the cheapest spells in the entire game. And if you use it on a large enemy and turn it into a normal one, that's usually a very good deal. So don't use Renew on low level enemies, but on the large lizard man, the two headed giant guys, that's when you want to use the Renew spell. As we head down through this cave, you may recognize this area from earlier. We just need to head up two screens from here, and we'll be at the boss. It's time for us to fight Moose. Now, Moose is difficult if you don't know what to do. Every time you hit this boss, it's going to shoot seven projectiles. 
So you want to stab this guy and then wait until it shoots seven projectiles at you. Just kind of count them out and then stab it again. Don't try to hit it two times or it's going to shoot 14 projectiles at you. It's a lot easier to just take this guy one stab at a time. So just stab and count. Stab. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Stab. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pings. Ah, ah, ah. And whenever he gets very low on health, you can go for a big sword swing to finish him off. But if he doesn't die, be ready for a whole bunch of counter pings. You should be able to block them all. When the demon is defeated, the hard shell splits in two, and inside there's a man. Although he's already half dead, or as the Miracle Max would say, mostly dead. You can't do much with all dead, just search his pockets for loose change, but with mostly dead, Xena's cross flute begins to play, and Xena appears to rescue Moose. Now they can finally be together, or they can finally meet? They had never met before, yet her ghost has been pining for this guy for like centuries? What is going on here? Well, I guess old timey people were weird. With the lovers reunited, our real reward here is we're able to move on to the Twin Towers, but for our troubles, they also give us the magic spell of Bombard. Bombard is pretty powerful magic. It will deal damage to all the enemies on the screen, and it only costs 10 magic points to use. The only real downside to Bombard is that it has sort of a long animation, so it's annoying to use it over and over again. Well, it's nice of him to write down the magic word of Bombard for us, just in case we would have forgotten it somehow. But we've now learned the spell, and we also get our magic completely restored. With that, we'll finally be able to exit the Haunted Island Cave and move on to the Two Towers. This area will look familiar if you saw the shortcut or level up trick that we did earlier. And the fact that the developers added a Two Towers section to this game makes me think that the similarities to Lord of the Rings were not lost on them either. Up here, we'll finally run into Alora Dannon, the very important baby from the movie that's not that big of a deal here in the game. I mean, in the movie, people are getting murdered left and right trying to find this baby. But here in the game, she just chilling down here at the base of these two towers, waiting for us to bring a couple crystals so she can use some baby magic on them. Yeah, we do need to come in here and speak with Alora Dannon to be able to open up the gate on the right tower, so we do have to come in here. But for now, Alora Dannon seems very safe, and the left tower is locked. So we have to go into the right tower, climb it to the top, get the blue crystal from the red tower, and as soon as we have the blue crystal, the door on the other tower will simply become unlocked. The towers are very straightforward. There are no branching paths here, so just follow the circle around and go in whatever door that you see. As long as you keep moving forward, you will keep climbing the tower. In here, you can fight these flying enemies by using that bombard magic that we just got. Try to get as many of them on the screen as you can and let them have it. And you can see that for 10 magic points, you can clear an entire screen's worth of enemies, but it won't work on more powerful ones. At least not a single casting. As we get higher up in this tower, you'll notice the lower levels will start appearing. And I like the little touch that Capcom added with the smaller fires that give you a sense of perspective. So just keep climbing the towers. This is the smaller of the two towers. You'll have to go up an additional floor whenever we climb the green or the blue tower, whatever you want to call it. And we'll have to do that next. This tower just doesn't have a lot of enemies in the tower sections. There is a few in these rooms on the side, so you'll have to deal with them, or you can mostly just walk right by them. Like, oh no, one skeleton. 
We can try the renew magic on this guy. It should be a pretty good deal. Let's see what happens. Yep, he turned into a single skull, so we can kill that quite easily, and it doesn't do as good of a job of blocking the door, or blocking at all for that matter. So that's what the renew magic does. It only costs 3 MP, so it's a pretty good bargain. Feel free to experiment with it. Sometimes the results are fun. So we'll just keep climbing up here. Whenever we get to the top of this tower, we're going to get the blue crystal and we'll meet with the sky spirit. Now you can see what the spell of renew is really for. It's for these mini boss style enemies. That one just turned into a bat. That's way easier than the two headed monster that it was before. And it only costs us three MP to do it. So the spell of renew is certainly not a mandatory spell to pick up and it doesn't seem like a great spell at first, but for only 3 MP we get pretty good value out of it. When we did the shortcut before we were able to completely skip getting the blue crystal, so this is the first time that we're actually meeting with the spirit of the skies, and I kind of like this guy. He takes full responsibility for his mistakes. He even admits to being the one who put Bav Morda into this world. He says that she is making his voice inaudible, and you know, she's trying to conquer the world. So that's why he's giving us the power of the blue crystal, and we'll have to take that and go climb the west tower. Something that we probably could have figured out. Now that we have the crystal, we can get off of this tower. And we don't have to use the ocarina and call Poe, we can just use our fleet magic, which will bring us right down to the base of the tower. And you don't actually have to talk to Alora Dannon right now to open the other door, so we can just walk right by her and enter the blue tower. Whether you call this the blue tower, the green tower, the left tower, the west tower, any way you slice it, this is the larger and more difficult tower, and you can see that you're going to be attacked a lot while you're just climbing the tower in the circular parts, not just in those large rooms in between. We can try using our magic of renew on the blue hornets, and this time they turned into trolls, which was a good deal, but it's possible they could turn into something that's actually worse than what they started, so I would recommend using Renew only on those larger mini-boss style enemies. Once again, this tower is completely straightforward. There are no branching paths. There's no way you can really get lost in here unless you forget which way is up. And whenever you get to these rooms, if you have to fight one of those large skeletons, that might be worth trying to use the Renew spell on. It turned it into a blue mage type enemy, which is very easy to just walk around. So keep on climbing the towers, and as you get higher up in this tower, you may end up facing those blob type enemies that will split into two parts, and if you let them go for long enough, they'll split into more than that, so you need to be careful of those guys. I recommend just trying to get them off the screen as quickly as possible, so you can try to avoid losing your magic points or try fighting them with the Devil Eye. Either way, you'll probably lose some magic points unless you actually are fighting them. So keep that in mind as you're climbing this tower. You're going to need at least 20 magic points to be able to use Fleet to get down to the bottom. So if you don't have those 20 magic points when you get to the top, you're probably going to have to come back in here and start fighting those Blob guys using the Devil Eye. It's especially dangerous when two of them start on the screen, because two could quickly turn into four, and four can turn into eight, and eight of those guys are going to eat a lot of your MP. You may end up with zero if you try to run away from that many of them. This is also one of those levels where you'll think you're getting close to the top, and you're actually not as close to the top as you might think you are. It probably seems like, yeah, we just need to climb like one more floor. No, we need to climb three more floors. So buckle up, that's what's going on here. Just a whole lot of tower climbing. Oof, the black hornets are probably the most dangerous ones. You wanna watch out for those. We were able to just quickly get past them. And we got more of those splitters trying to steal our magic points. I'd really rather they didn't steal our magic points. Didn't get us that time. 
definitely got us that time. We're down to 57, but we're still climbing. So just keep climbing to the top. No enemy that time, so that was nice. And I think this is the last floor. So we just have to get past these guys. Try not to let them take our last few points of magic. We're going to want to be able to use that fleet spell. And it would be nice to be able to call Poe as well. So just keep on climbing up and we'll be at the top. Once we speak to the spirit of the earth, we'll be able to get the red crystal that we need. And as long as we have at least 40 magic points, we'll be able to cast the fleet magic spell to get back down to the bottom of the towers. And after we speak with Alora Dannon to get the crest of the spirits, we'll be able to call Poe to take us back to the Tavern of the Traveler. If you don't have 40 MP after you get the red crystal, I recommend that you go back into the tower and just fight those splitter enemies until you have at least 40 MP. Then immediately cast Fleet to get out of the tower, and then we can cast the Ocarina after we have the crest. So you don't want to be messing around with your MP after you're back here on the ground. You'd have to climb up the tower a little bit to find enemies that will restore your magic, or go looking for them out on the world map. Either way, that's not going to be very fun. Just take care of it before you leave the tower. Once we have the Crest of the Spirits in our possession, we'll be able to leave this area behind and we won't have to come back ever again. So we can say our goodbyes to Alora Dannon, and then we'll leave that baby in the dust as we move forward in the game. There's nothing really in the game that tells you that once you get the Crest of the Spirits that Sorsha will get out of the way in the Rocky Mountain area. So that's a little bit of a design flaw in this game. It's not always super clear what you need to do next, but that's what we have to do. So once we have this crest in our possession, we're going to call Poe, and I know he's going to be a little bit annoyed, but it's time to go back to the bar. Uh, Willow? Seriously? The bar again? As a friend, Willow, do you know how many times you've been to the bar today? you may have a problem. Well, the bar is where we need to go, so the bar is where we need to go. And Poe will take us there happily with a smile on his face. We definitely took a beating in that last tower, so the HP and MP refill that we get here is going to be very helpful. Once we're all back to full power, we're going to head to the right, and we just want to go back to the water. So we'll skip the old lady, we don't need to talk to her. If we stay along the bottom here, we won't spawn the skull enemies in this room. And up here, you remember those crabs? Well, they're worth a hundred experience each. If we can get all three crabs to come out of their shell at the same time, we can kill them with two castings of the bombard magic. Now it takes a little while to cast bombard twice, it is kind of a long animation. But at the end of it, we'll have 300 experience points, so that's actually a good place to level up. I'm about to show you another place where we'll be able to level up that I like a little bit better, but you get 300 points for those crabs, so there are certainly worse places you can try to level up, especially once you get a little bit better magic than Bombard, and we're going to be able to get that better magic very soon. So we'll head up here, and remember, Sorsha was hanging out here before, but she's not there anymore. So now we can head over here to the right. And in this area, there may be some rocks that try to fall on you. Just try to get out of their way. And up here, you may spawn a mini boss on some of these screens, like this two-headed blue monster. Let's try the renew magic on him. And he turned into a hornet, a black hornet, so that's a kind of dangerous enemy. But we can easily just walk around it. And we'll head up here and go to the right. We're down to 54 hit points, so it's a good time to use a heal mace. And we're going to find a lot of really good magic over in the western mountains. So we're just going to head around this way. 
The path is very straightforward right here, but the rest of the mountains, they are very maze-like, so get ready for that. We'll equip our dragon sword. We still haven't found a better weapon than it. And we'll try to take on these red skulls, which are not a bad source of experience points. But don't worry about leveling up just yet. We're going to be able to level up very soon. We'll use that renew again on these guys, turning them into mage monsters. We'll just walk around them. And we'll head down here. This time we're facing the trolls. Bombard, very good against these troll enemies. You'll be able to kill them with just one casting of Bombard. The Black Hornets attack there. We'll try to avoid them. And over here, we can try Bombard on these Red Skulls, taking them out in a single casting. Very effective. And we'll just head straight down here, and then we're going to go to the right. So make your way to the right, and then head down to the bottom through this screen. We can bombard these enemies. We are getting low on magic points, though. So we're just going to hurry past these last few enemies. Make our way down here. We're about to get a full refill on our HP and MP. So just keep running to the right, and eventually we're going to come to a small house. So that's what we were looking for. Head on inside there. And the woman inside is going to give us one of the best magic spells in the game. She even says it herself. It's the strongest magic word in the world. We now have the magic word of thunder. This old lady was not kidding about the power of the thunder magic. It costs 20 magic points, which seems like a good bit, but it's very fast, and it will kill almost any enemy on the screen. The only thing that you don't want to use it against are those mage monsters that would cast thunder against you. As you head up here, we'll find another chest, and this one contains the heal ball magic. Heal Ball is just a more powerful Heal Mace spell. It costs 30 MP, but it'll restore twice as many hit points. Now that we have the Thunder Magic, let's put it to some use. If we head over here to the right, we're going to encounter some Mask enemies, and when we use the Thunder Magic on them, we'll be able to kill them very quickly, and they always drop items that give you 10 magic points back. So if you kill two mask enemies and you pick up both items, well then it didn't cost you any points. On this particular screen, the enemies always spawn. So while they spawn sometimes on this screen and sometimes on the one above the screen to the right, they always spawn on this one. So just keep killing these guys, you'll get 180 experience points each time you do it. But it's pretty fast, and you won't have to keep going back somewhere to refill your magic points all the time, because the magic points will just come right back to you. The minimum level that you need to beat the game is level 13, and you need exactly 216 magic points to be able to defeat the final boss. And at level 13, you'll have a maximum of 221, which will give you almost no margin for error. Even if you have full magic points, if you miss a single shot on the final boss, you'll lose the game. So I highly recommend you take advantage of this level up strategy and go all the way to at least level 15 right now. The highest level you can reach in the game is level 16, but that last level takes quite a long time to grind out, and I do have one more level grinding strategy that I'll show you later that we can use to take us the rest of the way. Now that we're level 15, we can do some serious damage and we're going to be very hard to kill, so now is a good time to finish exploring the mountain area. We already got the thunder and the heal ball out of this area, but that's not all that's here. There's still a pretty good shield, so we're going to head towards that right now. These evil face enemies can be easily taken care of with the thunder magic. And up here in this treasure chest, well, it's not ponytails, not cottontails. No, it's the tail shield. Plus 59 defense is a pretty good shield, and it seems to be made from the tail of a demon. All right. 
so we'll equip that. And from here, there's only one more very important spell that we need to get in the mountains. And it's a little bit of a hike from here. It's actually over in the western section. But we have a ton of magic points, so if we encounter any enemies, we can just blast them with lightning. So it shouldn't be too hard to make our way over there. So we're just retracing our steps to the bottom of the mountain and we're making our way back to the little house where we got the thunder magic. That'll get us a full refill of our MP and then we'll take that over into the western mountains. Red skeletons can't handle the thunder. Wow, that guy was really coming for us, but he couldn't handle the thunder either. The general direction we're trying to head is down and to the left, but occasionally you'll have to go right to get around some obstacles. So we'll head down here and then back to the left, and it should be a straight shot from here. So just keep on walking to the left, and we'll eventually run into that small house. And remember up above that is where we got the heal ball, but right now we're being blocked by a treasure chest that won't let us move any farther up there. So what we want to do right now is go into the West Rocky Mountains and find the Spectre Magic. The Spectre Magic is mandatory, so we definitely need it, but it's also very useful. It also costs a lot of MP, 50 magic points. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to level up right now. We're going to start casting magic spells that just require a lot more magic points. And we're going to need higher levels to be able to support that. So just keep working your way up the western mountains. Spectre is over in the upper right corner of the western Rocky Mountains. It's over on a little peninsula by itself. So just keep working your way up and to the right. And sometimes you'll have to head over to the left to be able to get there and the path winds around. So watch out for rocks and mini bosses and any enemies that come your way. The only ones that you have to be a little bit concerned about are those mage ones because you don't want to use thunder against them. But if those guys appear on the screen, just kind of walk around them. They're not that big of a threat. And up here we have found it. It's a monster's bone. Well, this bone, whenever you put it on your head, gives you the specter magic. You might think that this specter magic is the kind of thing that you would only use in very specific situations to get past enemy guards that are blocking a specific door or something like that. But it's actually a lot more useful than that. Whenever you cast the specter magic, you won't get any more random encounters. So it works on a timer. The longer you stay in the Spectre spell, eventually it's going to wear off. For your 50 magic points, it's sort of like the Repel magic in Dragon Quest, which is actually a good deal. Now that we're mostly leveled up, we don't really need to fight the enemies that much anyway. So we are going to be getting a lot of use out of that Spectre Magic. It's going to make the back end of the game a lot easier. So we're just working our way back to the house where we got the Thunder Magic, blasting anything in sight. And here's the bottom of the mountain. And we'll just keep going to the right and that will bring us to the house where we can refill our MP. And after that, it's going to be time to go to a new area. In this new area, you sort of need the Spectre Magic. If you don't use it, you're going to take a lot of damage. So that's one of the reasons why we had to go get that before we went this way. But you're going to see right away that the Spectre Magic is just useful. And it's something that you're going to want to have anyways. So make your way over here to the right. We're trying to get to the part of the map that's labeled to Tirazlin Path. So we want to go on the path that leads to the castle Tirazlin. Tirazlin is a place that's definitely in the movie, so it's nice that they added that location to the game, and it is a very important place that we'll need to go to to be able to win. A few moments ago, anytime we encountered enemies, we were just blasting them with the thunder spell. But we're going to be using that specter magic a lot in the next area. 
So I'm trying to save some of our MP right now because that spell costs quite a bit of magic to use and we're going to want to be able to cast it multiple times. So in this area, there's a bunch of weird alien mouths that come out of the ground. If you have no interest in getting bit up by these things, then I recommend that you use your specter magic. With the specter magic on, those mouths won't pay any attention to you, and you can just slink on by in blob form. So we're going to keep making our way to the left, and eventually the specter magic is going to wear off. It's going to wear off right around here, so you may just want to wait for it to wear off to make sure that you can cast it again before you have to fight those mouth monsters. If the mouths are active, you can still take damage even with the specter magic on. So make sure you use the specter magic before you come through here. And then we're going to go into this cave. This is the red cave. And it's a pretty easy one. There are not a lot of enemies in here, if any. In this small room, we're going to meet an old man, but this old man has nothing to say to a monster. So we just need to wait around out here until the specter spell wears off, and eventually it will. And then we can go back in here and see what's actually up with this guy. This guy says, you don't look like a person from Tiraz Lean. Huh, what gave it away? The fact that we look like a hobbit? Well, this guy has the witch's shoes that we are going to need to cross the bridge to get to Tiraz Lean. But unfortunately, he's not going to give them to us right now. To get the witch's shoes, we're going to have to meet with an old woman in a different cave. So that's where we're going to go next. It is not required that you talk to that old man before you visit with the old woman in the other cave, but if you want to see what he has to say, you can stop in there right now. That part was totally optional. When you get to this four-way intersection, you want to head downwards, and there are a few enemies in this part of the cave, but they're nothing you can't handle. Remember, if you want to attack these mask enemies, you'll need to use your Devil Eye. Try to avoid these mage enemies that use magic on you, and just follow the path around until you get to this room, where you'll want to go left, and that's going to bring you to the doorway that is labeled A on the map. That'll take you back out here to the path to Tiraz Lean, and we'll want to try to avoid the rocks that fall from above here, and just keep following this path along. It's going to take us to the purple cave. To avoid encounters, we can use our Spectre Magic, and we'll want to move quickly as soon as we cast it, because it does wear off after a certain amount of time. So just hurry to the right while you have the Spectre Magic on. No enemies will bother you, not even the falling rocks. We don't have enough Magic Points to keep casting Spectre over and over again, but I highly recommend using it in this outdoors section that is filled with very annoying enemies. We should turn back into Willow right about here, yep. And once we get to this section, we're in a pretty good spot. You just want to head over to the right, that's the bridge that we can't cross. And when we head in here, this is the Rocky Mountain Cave, also known as the Purple Cave. In this cave, we'll not only meet the old woman that will help us find the shoes we need to cross the bridge, but we'll also meet Adik, a strange character from the Eagle Clan, a proud race of bird people. This guy is going to give us the Wing Sword, and the Wing Sword adds zero attack. Yeah. It may seem terrible right now, but whenever we meet his brother, Abang, He's going to power it up, and it will suddenly be the best regular weapon in the game, so it's worth grabbing for now. You can see how unimpressive it is for the time being. I don't remember any Eagle Clan characters in the movie, which is unfortunate. Those costumes would have probably looked awesome. The Wing Sword is of course optional, but it's very easy to grab, so don't miss it. And we're just going to head over here to this room where we'll meet the old woman that we were looking for. She mostly seems annoyed at us, and it's kind of hard to believe that that was very important. But if we didn't talk to her, 
we would not be able to move forward with the game. So as soon as you've talked to that old woman, you can use the fleet magic to exit the cave, and you'll notice we're getting a little bit low on magic points, so we're not going to cast the specter magic this time. We're just going to walk back to the red cave and try to avoid the enemies as much as we can. The walk certainly feels like it takes longer when you have to deal with the enemies, but just do your best to stay alive, make your way around the bend, and just keep working your way back to the left. Here we have two of those red skeletons. Unfortunately, we're still working with the dragon sword. We will get a better weapon in Tyrez Lean. We'll actually get two of them. So we're going to keep heading to the left, do your best to avoid the rocks, and eventually we'll come to the bridge that will lead up to the cave. There it is. Keep trying to dodge the rocks. They don't deal that much damage, but you'd rather not get hit if you can avoid it. Back here in the red cave, we're just going to retrace our steps back the way that we came previously. We want to get to the room where that old man was. Because we talked to the old woman in the purple cave, he's going to say something different to us this time. So just head to the left here and just keep working your way to the left and you should not be able to miss the room that we're looking for. Kill any enemies that get in your way. We're level 15 now, we shouldn't have to worry too much. But we are low on health and we can't afford to spend our magic points on healing. So here's that old man. This time he asks if we're going to Tyrez Lane. Why yes, yes we are. Apparently we need to wear the shoes that he was wearing when he ran from the village. I guess that makes sense. With the witch's shoes in our possession, we can cast the fleet magic, which will bring us back right outside where we entered the cave. And we're going to be able to cast Spectre one more time so that we won't have to deal with any enemies on this walk. If you have fewer than 50 magic points left, well, you're just going to have to deal with it. Do your best to make your way to the castle of Tyrez Lean. That's where we're headed next. So we have transformed into a slime monster. And we're hurrying as fast as we can along this path. This is a timed spell. So we'll follow this bridge and then head back to the left. As long as we stay in specter form, we won't have to fight any enemies, so we'll try to stretch it out as far as we can. And we're going to turn back to Willow, like we always do, right near that bend. And we want to go right at this juncture, but instead of going into the cave, because we have the witch's shoes, we can now cross the bridge. That doesn't mean we won't be attacked by enemies on the bridge, including the very annoying red skeletons, or maybe the mage enemy that can cast thunder on us. Watch out for that guy. Oh, there he is right there. We'll just run away from him. No need to fight him, because once we get into the city of Tyrezlin, we're going to be able to get our health and magic refilled. As we round this bend, we'll find ourselves in the city of Tyrezlin. It's been a while since we've uncovered a new village or town, and sadly, this one is mostly abandoned. If we head all the way to the left, we can find one of the few residents of the town. She lives over here on the outskirts, in this building with the open door. So we'll talk to this woman, who immediately says, I don't know anything. And then she lets us know that if anyone knew that she lived here, other than us maybe, or other trustworthy folk, that Bav Morda would almost certainly come and kill her. Alright, this is a bad situation here in Tyrezlin. I was hoping that maybe coming here would be good. Well, we have to come here anyway, but there's not a lot going on in the city. There's one other person that's worth visiting, so we'll head up and meet with him. It's the guy that can refill our health and magic. So, you know, every village in town has to have at least one of those guys. 
And here in Tiraz Lean, we just want to head all the way up to the upper left corner of town. And this guy says, So, you've come to overthrow Bavmorda? Please rest here. Well, I guess anyone could have said that to this guy, but maybe he liked the way that we looked, I don't know. Certainly we seem trustworthy, right? Although there weren't very many residents left here in Tiraz Lean, the two that we did meet were pretty helpful. The guy that restored our HP and MP was certainly worth visiting, and the woman that said she didn't know anything at first actually had a good clue for us. You see, the castle has a locked gate on the front, and the only way that we're going to be able to get in there is by meeting a woman that hangs out in the mountains over to the east of the castle. So that was a good tip, and that's where we're going to go now. We're going to climb up this rocky mountain, and we're going to use our specter magic so that we won't have to face any enemy encounters. Anytime you're climbing a dark mountain like this and you have the choice between going left or right, always choose to go right. Left is going to be a dead end, so don't go left here, go right. If your specter magic wears off, you can cast it again, but you will need to wait for it to wear off whenever you get to the top, because the old woman does not want to talk to a slime. So just keep on climbing. Chaos is a ladder, and it looks like we did get one enemy here, but we'll just blast them with our thunder. And that should bring us to the top. So we'll head over here to the left, and this is the woman we were looking for. This woman says a lot of stuff that does not seem relevant at all to the fact that by talking to her, we are unlocking the castle of Tira's Lean. So I wish that maybe at the end of her little rant here she might say, And now Tira's Lean Castle is open. Go there, Willow. She doesn't say that, but that is what we need to do. And you can't call Poe right there on that spot. But if you just walk over here, you'll be able to call him, and he has a new destination that we can go to now. Instead of having to bring us to the bar like he almost always did in the past, now we can go back to Tira's Lean. He doesn't take us to the castle, he takes us over to the city, but that's good enough. We probably should stop by the guy's house that restores our HP and MP, because we did use quite a bit of it casting the Spectre magic. So you remember where that guy lives. He lives in the top left corner of the city. So that's where we're going to go. And we'll just keep following this path until we get there. We're already all the way on the left side. And whenever we get in there, I want to let this guy know we are definitely here to overthrow Bav Morda. Please give us food and lodging. Alright, once we're all healed up, we can make our way to the castle of Tira's Lean, and that's going to be our next dungeon. With the levels and power that we have right now, Tira's Lean is probably one of the easier dungeons, and we're going to be able to find a very good weapon inside, as well as one of the better shields. So once you get in here, you want to head to the right, if you encounter these enemies, we have a lot of magic points that we can spare here. We do not need them to defeat the boss, so feel free to use your magic liberally. If you're looking at the map, we're moving towards the door labeled letter A, and whenever we go inside here, we're just going to go down a short hallway, and whenever we come out on the other side, we'll be in the castle basement, and here we want to head down, and we can quickly thunder that zombie guy so we don't get turned into a pig, and we'll head over here to the right. These soldiers can get blasted by thunder as well, and inside this treasure chest is the game's second best shield, the Battle Shield. With the battle shields plus 74 defense, we'll have a total defense of 89, which is pretty good. And from here, we're going to head straight up to the top, so go all the way up. And then we're going to start heading to the left. 
We want to keep heading to the left until we come to a room where you're unable to go down. So we can go down here, that's not it. These skeletons are probably not even worth fighting. And here's the room we were looking for. In the next room you want to go down. So here you're going to go down and then we'll go down one more time and head to the left. You can blast those enemies if they're in your way. And that's going to bring us to the Wonder Sword. The Wonder Sword is the second best weapon in the game, well as far as regular weapons go. And it's the best regular weapon that you can find without having to enhance it in some way. So the Wonder Sword is pretty good. You'll want to equip that right away once you get it. And that's going to be the best regular weapon we'll have until we power up that wing sword that we found earlier. From the Wonder Sword, we're making our way to the doorway that is labeled B on the map. So just keep following the path. And we're going to head down here. And there's the door that we were looking for. We'll go through another short corridor. And when we come back out, we'll be back up on the first floor. And this time, we're going to be pretty close to the boss's room. So we just want to go all the way down to the bottom. And then cut across to the left. The boss's room is over in the lower left corner. If you see any of those zombie guys, blast them with your thunder. And just keep walking to the left. Right before you get to the boss's room, you'll see this guy. This is Eric who was definitely in the movie. So this guy is canon. Eric is going to give us the Kaiser Sword, which is very disappointing considering we just got the Wonder Sword, which is better. I kind of wish they could have given us the Kaiser Sword in one of those other caves a little bit earlier. Then we would have had some time to use it instead of immediately switching back to the Wonder Sword as we head up here into the boss's room, this is Ebersisk. You just want to go right to this spot on the floor, turn to the left and start mashing the attack button. Make sure you're not holding a direction when you mash the attack button. The boss will come right up to Willow and you will eviscerate this guy in seconds. Yeah, that boss is almost too easy. It is possible to mess that up. Try to make sure you're going to the right spot on the floor. Look at the patterns on the ground to guide you. And just make sure that you're facing the right direction and mashing the button. And you should have no problem beating that boss. So it looks like we're stuck here in prison. And we meet up with General Kale. A character that is once again from the movie. So here at the end of the game... We're starting to get back on track with the film plot, and we're also meeting up with Mad Mardigan once again. So Mad Mardigan is also a prisoner alongside us here, so he's not going to be able to help us get out. The way that we need to get out is to head down to the lower right corner, where we'll run into Frangine and Roll again. These two brownies are going to open up a passage that will get us out of the prison cell, and once we're out of here, we could either walk all the way out of Tirazlin Castle, or, and this might be a better idea, we can just cast our fleet magic spell. So as soon as we get out of here, we can equip fleet and cast it, and we will be out of here. We'll also get the powder of unrequited love. Now you may be wondering, what does that item do? Well, there's a cave near Tirazlin Castle, and if we had gone into that cave earlier, we would have found an empty treasure chest that blocks our way. But now that we have the powder of unrequited love, that treasure chest simply will not be there anymore. What that has to do with unrequited love, I have no idea, but that is exactly what the powder does. If you're low on HP or MP, you may need to go back to the town and tell that guy that you're here to overthrow Bavmorta. But I think we're doing just fine. So we'll make our way to the green cave. And outside, it's Frangine and Roll again. You don't have to talk to these guys, but they have some well wishes for us. And once you're done talking to them, we'll be into the caves again. 
So there's only one way we can go in here. Make your way around this curve and whenever you see an open door, that is where we're headed. So we'll go through here. And then we'll just follow this path upwards which will lead to another door. And that door is labeled B on the map. So once we go through door B, that will take us into another long corridor. And we want to stop in the next door that we see because inside there, that is where we are going to find the game's best shield, the Fury Shield. And here it is, right inside of this treasure chest. Once you have the Fury Shield, you'll want to equip it. It may be cursed by anger and hatred, but the only ones that are going to feel that are the enemies that are trying to damage you. So with the Fury Shield equipped, we're going to head back through the door that we came in, and we're going to keep moving along to the right. At this point, we may want to use our Spectre Magic. We could get attacked by enemies in this cave, but if we're using the Spectre Magic, they won't be able to get us and we still have a decent amount of magic points. So we'll just turn ourselves into a slime and follow the cave until we find the exit. So keep following the cave along and eventually you're going to find a door that's going to take us back to the mountains. If you remember where the heal ball magic was, well, the treasure chest that contained the heal ball isn't going to be there anymore. Make sure you walk past that first doorway, that leads to a dead end. And if you have to use the Spectre Magic again, feel free to use it, because we're going to be coming out near the house where we got the Thunder Magic, so we'll be able to refill our magic points there. So just keep working your way through the cave. It's a long and winding cave, but using the Spectre Magic, nothing bad is going to happen to us, so we should have no problem getting to the end. So we'll just keep following this along. Our Spectre Magic has worn off and we don't have the MP to cast it again, but that's okay. This brings us out right where the Heal Ball Magic was, and if we head down here, we can go into this house and get our HP and MP completely refilled. This woman had a lot of faith in Willow when she taught him the very powerful thunder magic, but now she is confident that he is the chosen one that can save the world. She'll restore our HP and MP, and now that that treasure chest that had the heal ball is out of the way, we can make our way up the mountain to our final destination, Nokmar Castle. As usual, we're going to cast our Spectre Magic so that the enemies won't attack us. We would meet a lot of enemies on the way to Nakmar Castle, and using the Spectre Magic will make it much, much easier. Once we get all the way to the castle, we'll also unlock that as one of the places that Poe can take us to, so we won't have to climb this mountain a second time. If we run out of Spectre Magic, we'll just want to cast it again. And that's probably going to happen pretty soon. Yep, right there. So we'll just cast the Spectre Magic again. And we'll continue up the path. Whenever we get to the castle gate, there's going to be a guard there. But if we have our Spectre Magic, the guard will let us through. Once we're inside the castle, unfortunately, all the doors inside are going to be locked, and we're going to have to find a key, and that key is not within Nokmar Castle, so we're not going to be able to finish the game on this very first run of the castle, but we will be able to get it on the second. So this guard, yeah, he is not very brave. Oh no, a monster! And that's the last we'll ever see of that guy. Once you're inside, make sure your Spectre Magic is still going and head all the way to the left. And when you get to the left corner, you're going to go all the way down to the bottom. So we're trying to get to the lower left corner here on the first map of the castle. Don't go into that door, that's just an empty room. Down here, we're going to meet Abang. 
and that is Adik from the Eagle Clan's brother. We need to wait until our specter magic wears off. Talking to a bang here serves two purposes. The first is we have to talk to him to be able to advance the game. Until we talk to this guy, we won't be able to get the key to Nokmar Castle. And to get that key, we're going to have to return to Tirazlin after we talk to this guy. But the other thing that it does is that he's going to power up the Wing Sword and make it the most powerful weapon in the game with a plus 84 to our strength. So, of course, that's not as much as the Devil Eye, but it does work on a lot more enemies than the Devil Eye does. You know when you need the Devil Eye. Once we've met with a bang, we can use our fleet magic to get out of the castle, and then we can use our ocarina to call Poe, and Poe is going to take us back to the village of Tirazlin. Over in Tirazlin, we'll be able to get the key to Nokmar Castle, and to find it, we need to meet up with that old woman again from the mountain. This time, though, she's in her house, and because we met with a bang, her house will be unlocked, so we're going to go to a house that we weren't able to get into before. You won't be able to find this woman by just looking around the regular path in town. We need to go all the way up to the castle and head to the outskirts of town where her house is located. So we're just going to go all the way up to the top. We'll go up to the castle gate and then we're going to head to the left. So make your way over here to the left and we'll find a path that leads downward so follow that and at the end of that path we'll find one more house. This house appears to be closed but whenever you walk up to it the door will magically open. Very sneaky. All we need to do is name drop Eric and she's happy to give us the key to Nokmar Castle. Why does she have the key to Nokmar Castle? Well, she was captured and taken there at one point, so by some kind of twisted video game logic, obviously she would have a key that would unlock every door inside. Now that we have the key to the castle, that's not the last thing that we need to complete the game. You're probably thinking, Hey, after we got level 13, we never went and transformed Finn Rizel, and you're right. We have to do that to be able to beat the game, so that's why we're going to call Poe and have him take us to the Tavern of the Traveler. This is the closest location to Finn Rizel's cave. To get to Finn Rizel, we're going to go up and into the water. We can still go into the water because we still have the Waka Seed. It never wears out. So we'll just follow this path around. We'll avoid the skulls by staying low here. We'll try to watch out for the crab enemies. You could just use thunder on those guys, but you still have to wait for them to come out of their shells, so we'll just walk right by them. That seems to be the easiest way to do it. And we'll head down into this watery path, and we'll follow it up here. And when we get to the other side, we will be very close to where we need to go. So we're just going to head in here, and because we are level 13 or higher, we're level 15, this time we will be successful when we transform Finn Rizel. With all the other things we need to do to finish the game, it's very easy to forget that you have to come back here and get the power from Finn Rizel. But if you don't do this, You'll eventually reach the final boss, and you'll have no way to fight back against her. So this is very, very important. Once Finn Rizel has been transformed into a human, we should have everything that we need to defeat Bab Morda. We still haven't reached the game's highest level, level 16, so that's the next thing that we're going to do before we go and try to finish the final castle. You certainly don't need level 16 to be able to beat the game, but having more magic points will make it easier. You'll notice that Nokmar is the sixth and final destination that Poe can take us to, so we'll have him pick us up and take us there now. This final level grind trick is a little bit riskier than some of the others, but it is very fast. 
we're going to equip our thunder magic and just use it to blow through any of these skeletons that get in our way as we work our way to the left up here. We're trying to go down the path so that we can get to the area where the splitter enemies spawn. And we're going to let those enemies split twice so that there's eight of them on the screen. And then we're going to kill them with a single use of thunder magic. So here's a screen where they spawn right here. And we're going to switch to the devil eye so we can keep these guys off of us until they've split twice. And as soon as they finish splitting the second time, that's when you want to use the Thunder Magic. They will move very fast when there's a lot of them on the screen. Each time you do this, you'll get 1800 experience as well as a bunch of items to restore your magic points. If your magic ever dips down below 100 after you collect all of those items, you may want to return somewhere to get a refill. And then you can just have Poe fly you back here. It won't take very long to get the 99,990 experience you need to reach level 16. So have a seat in the foyer, take a number, I was lightning before the thunder. And that's it, we're level 16. So once you've reached the game's highest level, we can call Poe, we'll get a refill on our magic because every point of magic is going to be important as we do the final dungeon. So we certainly want to be at full power before we get there. We'll fly back to the bar. That's a great place to restore our HP and MP. And then we are going to use 20 magic points to have Poe fly us back to Nokmar Castle. But we can kill some enemies within the castle to get those magic points back. And at level 16, we can afford to spare the 20 points that it costs to fly to the castle. So once we get outside, we will call Poe one last time, and we'll let him know that his debt is paid after this. Poe, we're not going to be needing you anymore. You have certainly served us well. Because we're trying to conserve all of our magic points for the final battle with Bavmorda, we're not going to be able to just thunderbolt all of the enemies that we see in the castle this time, and we're also not going to be spending 50 magic points to use the specter spell so that we can avoid encounters that way. We're going to just have to do it the old fashioned way, and if you have your devil eye on, you'll be able to attack these zombie guys, and when you kill them, you'll get some of your MP back, so if you spent that 20 magic points to fly here on Poe, you can very quickly get that back, and if you do use any other magic, you could farm these enemies at some point to try to get some of it back as well. You won't be able to use the Devil Eye to defeat these guys, but the Wing Sword will make short work of them. So we're just going to follow this path downwards. Just keep working your way down. Here's another zombie, we need to use the Devil Eye on him. And you can see that at level 16, we handle all of the weapons very fast. We're going to go up here and then to the left. And that's going to take us to this room, which is labeled A on the map. So go inside door letter A, follow this short corridor, and when we get up here, we'll be on the second floor. We want to head up here and then to the right. There are some pitfalls on these floors, but if you follow my lead and go the way that I go here in the video, you should have no problem. I wouldn't waste too much time fighting these guys, but you don't want them to take all of your magic away. So just fight them when you can and make your way to the upper right corner. This stairway is labeled B on the map. On the other side of stairway B, we simply need to go to the upper right corner again, so avoid that doorway, and up here we're going to find Sorsha. Sorsha is hanging out with our good friend Mad Mardigan. Sorsha seems to have captured Mad Mardigan again, but this time Willow tries to use the powder of unrequited love. I'm not sure if he was going to use it to make Sorsha fall in love with him, but it lands on Mad Mardigan, and just like in the movie, he falls head over heels for Sorsha. Mad Mardigan gets a little bit poetic on us, saying some of his lines from the movie, 
but then he goes into some stuff that's definitely just for the game. He says he does not believe the prophecy. There is no chosen hero. If there is a hero, every living creature in the world is it. All of us. The Daikini clan, the Nelwyn clan, the Eagle clan with the wings, and the rabbit-like Nail clan are it. All are living to their fullest, and the effort to put forth into living is the greatest strength in this world. Um, yeah, thanks, Mad Mardigan. Well, in any case, Sorsha lends her strength to Willow, and so does Mad Mardigan. And once this scene is over, we'll be able to move on. Beyond the door, though, is not Bav Morda, but another boss fight. A boss fight with Kale. Kale can deal a lot of damage if he hits you, but he always attacks with his sword on your left side. So he's going to be swinging that sword on the left. What we want to do is stand to the right of Kale. Then he'll be missing us with his attacks, and we'll be able to use our swinging attack to deal a bunch of damage to him. If he moves towards you, just keep moving to the right, and just stay over towards Kale's right foot, and you should be able to easily take him out. If you mess up, you're gonna take a bunch of damage, so you do need to be careful there, but if you do it right, you should have no problem defeating that guy. Kale is worth a bunch of experience points, but we don't need them. We just need to press onward. Keep making your way to the top of the castle. There's not a ton of enemies here. Some of them will block your way. Others you can just step around. But for now, just keep making your way to the next door. And when you get to this room, you just want to head down and to the left. So head over here to the left and go right into this door. So not a very difficult section there. And then you just keep continuing your climb. There's not as many enemies up here, so just enter this door. At this point, if you have low hit points, you may consider using your heal mace or your heal ball. But remember, you need at least 216 magic points to be able to finish the final boss. And any extra magic points that you have will give you a chance to miss at least once or maybe even twice. So I don't recommend using any healing magic at all. Just save it for the cane. And this is it. In the next room, we're going to face Bav Morda. Make sure to equip your magic cane, and whenever you get in here, we'll see a short cutscene before the battle. This is the end of the road, Bav Morda. With the combined powers of Cherlindra and Finn Razel, I, the great sorcerer Willow, will seal you away in the nether realm forever. Once the battle begins, make your way to the bottom of the screen, turn to the right, and when Bavmorda flies into your sights, shoot her slowly but steadily with your magic cane. You can't afford to miss very many times. Once her energy has been depleted, the most difficult part of the battle is over, and you will have retrieved the Crest of the Spirits. She says, no, Willow, don't, I'll be destroyed. Yeah, that's the point, you stupid hag. Do you need more iron in your diet? Because you're about to eat steel. All you need to do in the final part of the battle is walk to the middle, face upward, and just rapidly mash the attack button. As long as you have the wing sword equipped, Bavmorda will fly right into your blade, and she will quickly be defeated. And that's it. We've done it. We've beaten Willow. All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. The end of the game is a good bit different than the end of the movie. Here in the game they had to wrap up that plot that they had started about the sky and the earth spirits, and in the end Bavmorda's menace was thwarted, and the sky spirit took her back up into the sky, where she was never seen again. After all of that, the people elected a baby as their queen, and somehow that worked out. They lived happily ever after, wishing for her health and happiness. But sometimes that's just how things work out in video games. Roll the credits. Capcom may have strayed pretty far from the plot of the movie here, but I think it was a good design decision ultimately, 
because for a game like this, you can't just rigidly stick to the plot of a movie. It doesn't work. You need to be able to rework some elements, add in some different bosses, and do all those sort of things to be able to make the game flow properly, and I think they had a really good sense of what would work here. It's a lot more difficult in modern times to be able to use licenses in this way since a lot of the people that hold those licenses don't want you taking these kind of liberties with it, but I do think that works out the best for video games in the end. So this is a very good effort from Capcom, and even if you've never seen the Willow movie, this is a game that might be worth playing. It's just fun. Years later, Capcom would get to work on The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, and it makes me wonder, did Nintendo see this game and think, yeah, I think that Capcom may be one of those companies that would be capable of carrying the Zelda franchise, even if it was just for a handheld entry. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally beat Willow and return peace to the kingdom of Tiraz Lean. If it did, make sure to give it a like, and make sure to subscribe for more videos, because there will always be more evil queens that were sent from the skies to take over the world. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.